blessing of worship time. Thank you for being here today. And it's, it's hard to believe that summertime is just about over. Coach leaned over and said, next week is August? I said, yes, yes, next week is August. Our teacher's getting ready. Some of the teacher's already back at school. Uh, students going back. Uh, teams beginning to practice. Uh, fall will be in the air pretty soon. Uh, we've got... Uh, had a great summer. God has blessed us abundantly. Love out loud. Uh, getting our missionaries back, uh, uh, Dwayne Partridge, we welcome you home back from Peru. Appreciate you and the good job that you did. Uh, Emma Grace Clark is going to be flying in tonight back to New Orleans. She has been for about uh, uh, four weeks, I believe, uh, at, uh, down in uh, the DR with the Nelsons. And so she'll be back. Hope next week we can uh, we recognize her. Uh, also, Maddie is uh, over uh, in Uganda with the Hills. And so we've got a lot of missions going on. And we've had a great, great time uh, this summer. We've been praying about this for about a year, uh, having Coach Bowden come. We invited him to come. Been very excited about this. We, tonight is our night of champions that we do in connection with the Mississippi Baptist Convention, Florida Baptist Association, and then with our FCA, District 5 FCA. We're expecting a lot of students here tonight, a lot of student athletes here tonight, and I, I believe we're going to have a lot of adults here. Uh, I expect you to be here. Uh, we're going to have company, okay? And when you have company, you need to be at home, all right? It'd be bad somebody come see you and you not be there. So you need to be here. Why? Because we need to welcome everybody. We need to let everybody know that uh, we are excited about them being on this campus. No one's going to come on this campus without somebody hugging their neck, shaking their hand, uh, and know that they're cared about. So you be here tonight. Uh, we're excited to have Coach Tommy Bowden. Uh, Jenna had the privilege to hear Coach Bowden a couple of years ago at uh, Ministry Matters Conference, Pastors Conference down in Destin. He and his wife Linda spoke. Outstanding job. Encouraged us. Blessed us. Uh, the story that I remember the most, Coach, is the one you told about being on the pastor search committee. That really blessed me. I said, that guy's the real deal. Amen. Uh, anybody serve on the pastor search committee? And uh, he really blessed us pastors with that. Uh, but I heard him speak and heard his heart and know that he has a love for God. Uh, he and his wife, Linda, have two children. Uh, they have uh, a son and daughter. They have a, four grandchildren, all of them boys. And uh, so they're... He's very busy. Uh, he is a former coach at Alabama. Lydia, good, that's right. Y'all do know that Wade's wife is a graduate of the University of Alabama, and she also grew up in the Holy Land along with the pastor. But anyway, we're not gonna go along with that. But uh, she is a graduate of Alabama. He coached at Alabama, Auburn, Kentucky, West Virginia, Florida State, and Duke. He served at head coach, as head coach at Tulane uh, University and then uh, as head coach at Clemson. And Clemson uh, is uh, our nemesis now. And, uh, but we appreciate, appreciate you, Coach. But wonderful man of God. Love him. It just You're going to love him. You're going to connect with him. Uh, he, he's, he's one of us. He's a, he's a real guy. And that's what impressed me most of all. No pretense, no facade, no veneer, uh, the real thing. And so I'm excited about him being here. I'm excited about him speaking to us. And I'm excited, excited about what he's going to do this evening, how God's going to use him. And so, church, we are very honored to have Coach Tommy Bowden with us today. I'm going to ask you to stand, and let's welcome him to the pulpit at Northcrest Baptist Church. Thank you, uh, Pastor. You know, I, uh, being in a coaching family, my father's the head coach at Florida State, and I coached for 32 years. He lists all those schools that I've coached at. He actually left out East Carolina and Tulsa. I wasn't there very long, but so there's more than that. But I've uh, been involved with a lot of, I've always been Southern Baptist my whole life. I always joined Southern Baptist churches when I went. The 10 years that my father, who's also a coach, used to be a head coach at Florida State, but the 10 years he spent at West Virginia as a head coach, we were in a small church, Southern Baptist Church, that probably was about the size of this section, this section, only about maybe 200 people. It was a small church. 
<clears throat> and uh, that's where I had, was junior high, high school, college. Most of my formal years growing up, I was in a small Southern Baptist church. My parents had six children. They had uh, girls on the end. The first is a girl, the last is a girl, four boys in the middle. And then uh, going to a small church like that, you know, usually in Southern Baptist churches, you know, the rows that are open are usually ones down in the front. Everybody sits in the back, filters down front. Well, that large a family, when we went to church, we're usually late. So when we came in, we'd have to sit down front. And I can remember one experience when I was probably about 13 years old. When we came to church, usually late, we had to sit right down here or right down here. And there's a pecking order when we came in. There was a way that we, we had to sit. When we came down, my mother would go in first. Then my two sisters would go in. My brother Jeff and Steve, who didn't fight much, they would go next. Then Terry and I, the one that used to be the head coach at Auburn, we're a year and a half apart. We fought all the time because we were so close. We'd have to sit in next. Then my father would sit on the end, put his arm on the rest, just like you're doing right there, and he'd sit and he'd control, every, he'd control me and Terry. I don't know if any of y'all had your children in church where you would take your thumb and your forefinger and dig it in your kid's neck when he was acting up and actually draw blood and get some skin underneath your fingernails. But that's what my father would have to do with, with Terry and I. And I can remember one sermon. I said, I was probably around 13. Terry was probably 12. We were sitting right down here. And, and the pastor looked at my father giving a sermon on faith. And he said, sir, do you have faith? And my father said, yeah, I've got, I've got faith. He said, okay, sir, if I were to take a 30-foot eye beam about 10 feet high, or sorry, 10 inches high, 10 inches wide and stick it on two bricks there and stretch it down here and stick it on two bricks there and raise it about 10 inches. He said, sir, would you have enough faith to walk across that beam? And my father shook his head and said, yeah, I have enough faith to do that. He said, now, sir, I'm going to take that same eye beam up to New York City, stretch it across the two tallest buildings in New York, a thousand feet up. He says, now, would you have enough faith to walk across that eye beam? My father shook his head and he says, no way. He said, okay, I'll give you $1,000. If you'll walk across that eye beam, would you have enough faith for 1000 My father said, no way. He says, okay, sir. He says, now I'm going to take one of your children, and I'm going to hold them off the other end. You know, come across. I'm going to drop one of your children. He said, now do you have enough faith to walk across that eye beam? I remember my father, he looked down at me and Terry, and he looked up at the pastor, and he said, which one? <laughs> he would have... He would have dropped Terry. He wouldn't have dropped me. I know that. But I've got, I only have two children, as the pastor mentioned. I have a son right now. It's about 37. I got my daughter's about 34, about 35. My daughter lives in Mobile. Got two sons. My son lives in Atlanta. has got two sons. My daughter, who's younger, was actually married first. She was a, went to school at Clemson, was a school teacher and student taught. If any of you go into teaching, she student taught her last year or last half a year and actually got offered a job that last year. Uh, student teaching year and had a job before she got married. She married a, a guy that played baseball at South Alabama in Mobile. He had a job offered to him. So when they got married right out of college, they both had jobs. Well, as you know, my wife and I as parents, we felt pretty good that they would have a, have a good chance to financially get started. We, we tried to leave with no debt, but we cut them off the credit cards when they got married. I said, you're on your own. You get married. I ain't paying for nothing. So we felt good about them. Now, my son, a year or so later, got engaged, but he was finishing his third year of law school up in Virginia. His wife went to the University of Tennessee. She was a senior. He was finishing law school. Neither one had a job, and they got married. And my wife was a little concerned at my son, and they didn't understand that uh, when they get married, that was it. She said, hey, he doesn't, has a, you know, he doesn't even have a job. He's getting engaged. So she said, well, you talk to him when he comes home this weekend from law school. I said, yeah, I'll, be, I'll talk to him. So my son comes home Friday afternoon. I take him upstairs on Friday night. And I said, son, I, his name's Ryan. I said, Ryan, I said, you and Amy are fixing to get married. Now, she's finishing up. Tennessee doesn't have a job. I said, you going to finish up law school, going to graduate. But you don't have a job yet. I said, listen, you've got to get an apartment. You're going to have to pay for it, an apartment, a house or something. I said, I'm not paying when you get married, you're on your own. So just remember now, you got, you're getting engaged, getting married, you're going to have to pay for that apartment. He looked at me and said, Dad, listen, I got enough faith in God. God will supply me an apartment. God will see to it that I have housing. He says, I'll, God will get it done. I've got enough faith in God. I said, okay, okay, son, that's, that's, that's good. You got enough faith, God will do that. I said, now listen, you've been driving home from law school about every other weekend. 
And I said, that car is broken down twice. I've paid for it. That's over when you get married. No more of that. So just know when you get married and your car breaks, you're on your own. I ain't paying for it. He said, Dad, God's not going to let me go without transportation. I had enough faith in God. God will see to it that I have a car and I have transportation. I said, okay. I said, and what about food? You're not coming over here to eat every night. I said, you're going to have to pay for her food. Y'all got to eat and put groceries on there. At the end of the month, don't be looking toward us. You thought about that with you not having a job yet. He said, God's not going to let us go hungry. He said, Dad, I got enough faith in God. God's going to see that we're fed. God will see that we have food on the table. I've got faith in God. I said, okay, son. So he takes off and goes out somewhere that night. So my wife, Linda, is down in the kitchen. So I walk down there, and she says, how did it go? I said, well, it went pretty good. She said, what's he thinking? I says, he thinks I'm God. So <laughs> any of y'all with, with children, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I, uh, I'm very, very honored to be here. I say, well, gosh, why are you honored to be in Meridian, Mississippi? I live in Destin, Florida. I live on the beach. You know, it's a pretty nice day today. So why are you honored to drive up here and speak in Meridian? And the reason is because I believe what I'm fixing to tell you. I believe it is 100% true. And it is worth getting up 5 o'clock in the morning and driving from Mobile and coming up here and driving back late tonight. I believe it that much. I don't mean to stand and insinuate by being up here that I'm perfect, that I'm better than you because I'm up here and you're sitting out there. I'm not. I need God just as much as you do. I do not profess perfection. I'm not a biblical scholar. I don't have my doctorate. I don't have my PhD. I've got, I'm not a biblical scholar. I have a physical education degree from West Virginia, and I was a football coach. But it was important to me, and football, uh, our, our football, I should say, was a huge, huge priority in my life. It was just not the priority. The most important thing to me was being obedient to God, being a godly father, being a godly husband, being a godly coach, and trying to be obedient to God. That's what was important to me. I surely was not perfect. You know, coaching is about leadership. Don't go into coaching if you want to be a leader. You, you have to be a leader if you're going to go into coaching. But everybody in here, to some extent, is a leader, whether you like it or not. If you're a father, if you're a husband, then you are a leader. If you're a mother, if you're a wife, you are a leader. If you profess Christianity, if you, if you say, I'm a Christian, you're a leader. If any of y'all are athletes, you're a leader. If you're a salesman, if you own a company, you're a business, you're a leader. About everybody in here, regardless of age, is a leader whether you like it or not. John Maxwell, a Christian author, said this about leadership. He said, leadership is influence. Uh, Billy Graham, and I'm quoting Billy Graham. Billy Graham said this about leadership. He said, the moral meltdown in the United States comes from a lack of leadership. He said, it would be tragic to divorce character from leadership. You can't separate the two. If you're going to be a leader, you better have integrity, you better have morals, you better have character, you better have a moral standard. As a coach, being a leader, I used to study leaders. I, I, I always liked the military for some reason. I don't know why. And I, I studied a guy named Patton, a guy named MacArthur, Schwarzkopf, Colin Powell. I'd study successful people and read books on leadership. The greatest leader of all time, the greatest leader of all time, the GOAT. I didn't know what the goat meant. Some of y'all, I used to see these, I, about a month ago, I used to see these uh, discussions about LeBron James and Michael Jordan, who was the greatest, and they would have goat, G period, O period, A period, T. And what the heck does that, yeah, well, I know it's the greatest of all time now. It means the greatest of all time, G O. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was going to, yeah, thank you. But it meant goat. But the goat leader of all time, 2.3 billion followers today. There's only 7 billion people in the world. 2.3 billion, the GOAT, Jesus Christ, the greatest leader. 2,000 years ago, he died, and he's got 2.3 billion followers today. If there was Facebook, can you have any friends he'd have on Facebook? It'd be about 2.3 billion. That'd be a bunch. He'd have a Twitter account that'd be out of here. But talking about leadership, study, study the best. I always thought to... Uh, to, to be su successful in life if you could just make good decisions. If you make good decisions, you'll be successful in life. And that's what 
This book is. This book is a book about making good decisions. That's what this is. I don't know how much you fought. We talk about college football. Football is huge down in this area. Remember a quarterback named Johnny Manziel, the freshman quarterback at Texas A&M that made, won the Heisman as a freshman. Number one draft pick, I think, of the Cleveland Browns, an instant millionaire. Bad decision, bad decision, bad decision. They started in high school, went through college, followed in the NFL. Now I, I can, you can't find him. Played in some kind of league. I've never heard of him, got kicked out. A couple years after that, a guy named Jameis Winston, a quarterback at Florida State, won the Heisman as a freshman, national championship, first-round draft pick, made the bad decision with girls. I don't know if y'all remember this. Bad decision on crab legs. Bad decisions on saying something embarrassing in a student union in front of the public. Goes to Tampa Bay. Bucks, first-round draft pick, last year start the season. Suspended the first three games. Bad decision, bad decision, bad decision. If you make good decisions... And more good decisions than bad decisions, you'll be successful in marriage, in business, in your social life, choosing friends. And that's what, that's, that's what this book is. This book is a book about making good decisions. Bible actually means book of books. If you look at Bible, Bible means book of books. Got 66 books. Got 40 authors wrote the 66 books. I used, to have, I used to talk like this to my team when I was a head coach at Clemson, head coach at Tulane. I'd shut the door, keep everybody out, and I'd talk like this, like I'm talking to my team. No media would be in there. I wouldn't let them in there. And I can remember talking to my team, and I'd say, man, Bible, you've got to make good decisions. The Bible's a book about making decisions. The Bible means book of books. I said, 66 books, 40 authors. And I'd always see my defensive line. When I said that, they'd be back here scratching their head. 66 books, 40 authors. I'd say, amen. All that means is some of the authors wrote more than one book. Some of them wrote two, some of them wrote three. <laughs> they couldn't figure out 66 books and 40 authors. That's why I got that. Book of books, that's what it means. This, and, and, actually, there's been about 24 or 25,000 manuscripts unearthed back in the Middle East, written in Aramaic, written in Greek, written in Hebrew, that verify this book, that verify. We found them there. They've been discovered. Some of this book was written by eyewitnesses. Uh, 2 Peter 1.16 says, we did not come to chase cunningly devised fables. We have seen his majesty. They saw the miracles and they wrote about it. We unearthed the manuscripts. This book has all the answers. Well, how do you know that? Colossians 2, 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You don't know it, how to raise children, how to marriage or business or making decisions. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ac application. You take that knowledge if you're a mechanic, you know a lot about cars, you take all that knowledge, then you can learn to work on cars and you put it to work and make a living. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Now, some people, especially today, will try to tell you, educated people, biblical scholars will try to tell you, some of them, that those 40 guys that wrote the Bible, that's just their opinion. The Bible is the opinion of those 40 guys. The Bible is the opinion of man. Well, what's the Bible say? 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21 says, as holy men wrote, they were moved, they were inspired, they were breathed on. Where's my mic? They were breathed on by God Almighty himself. This is not the opinion of man. This is the word of God. Over about 2,000 times, it says, thus saith the Lord, or the equivalent. And then there are some other religions that say there's another book that goes along with this book. You should read. The Bible's good, but we have another book that you're supposed to read with this. And then some people say, well, my lifestyle, my lifestyle is, is it says don't do it in this part. If you take that part out, I can do the rest of it. Just take that part out, and I'm all right. What's the Bible say about adding and subtracting? It's got all the answers. Revelations 22, 18, 19. If you add into this book, God will add into you the plagues of death. 
If you take away from this book, God will take your name out of the book of life. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with this word. You ever driven through the state of Texas and you seen those bumper stickers that say, don't mess with Texas? Don't mess with this book. And uh, the last thing as I get into what I'm going to talk about, as I speak to you, just so you'll know, why is he talking like that? I, I believe this book is the inerrant and infallible word of God. What, what do you mean inerrant? No error. That's what inerrant means, no error. Infallible. What's infallible mean? Falsehood. There's no falsehood. That's, that's what I believe. I believe in little interpretation. What do you mean little interpretation? What do you mean by that? The story of Jonah getting swallowed by the whale and living in the whale three days, spitting up. When Jesus mentions it, it's mentioned in the Old Testament. That story, there are a lot of, a lot of pastors, not this one, but there are pastors that believe that that's symbolic. That was a dream. It's kind of made up just to, it's, it's a story made up to represent something else. I got one question. Jonah getting swallowed by a whale is the only question I got. Was it a blue whale or a gray whale that swallowed him? I know he got swallowed. <laughs> so as I speak to you this morning, you'll say, well, why did he say that? Why did he, that's, that's what I believe. And that's why I'm going to say what I'm going to say. But I, but, but, but I believe in everything that I said as far as being the word of God. You know, nowadays, it's important that we defend the Word of God. If you defend the Word of God nowadays, they say, well, you Christian, you're judgmental. You're intolerant. You're not inclusive. Hey, I didn't write it. I'm, I'm just a newspaper boy. I'm not the editor. Take it up with the author of the book. But we need some backbone to defend the Word of God and be bold how we defend the Word of God. That's like... Uh, the thing that, you, that I spoke at where I first met your pastor. That pastor was, I don't know, maybe 50 of them. They all think like he does. Those things that I just mentioned, in there, that's what he believes. You're lucky. There are a lot of pastors that don't believe that. You got one that believes that. Amen. And that's like, you know, some of you people my age or older, you might have heard of Paul Harvey. The guy used to tell that story. Then stop, be a commercial. Say, now the rest of the story. Heard that? Because nowadays we have a lot of pastors that'll talk about grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and heaven, and that's good. But man, what about the rest of the story? There is sin, there is repentance, there is disobedience, and there is hell. I'm sorry. And if I'm sitting out there, I want to go to church, and then if sin keeps me out of heaven, if sin disappoints God, I want somebody to stand up here hey, and tell me what it is. You tell me what I'm doing wrong. And you're very fortunate. You have a guy that does that. There's not enough of them. There's some of them. I've met about 50 of them down there, and, and he's one of them. But hey, what I'm, the point, that's hard. It's, 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 it's difficult. But you can't be afraid to defend the Word of God. And a, lot of, a lot of people tell you, especially nowadays, when you walk outside those doors, that Bible doesn't apply today. This is 2019. Some of this was written 3,000 years ago. Some of it 2,000 years ago. You open up the Bible, it doesn't have United States. It doesn't have United States. Also, it doesn't have anything about Alabama or Auburn or Mississippi State or Southern Miss. Doesn't have internet. Doesn't have Facebook. How can this apply to today? Well, if the Bible's got all the answers, what's it say to refute that? Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mark 13, 31, heaven or earth will pass away, God's word will not. This does not change. Defend it, defend it, honor it. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't change. You know, you look at the United States of America today, you're talking about a blessed country. You're talking about the hand of favor of God Almighty being on a country. The United States is really self-sufficient. We've just become the number one producing oil. We used to depend on the Middle East for oil, not now. We're number one. We could be independent if we wanted to. We're, this country has been blessed. If, at 250 years old, right around 250 years old, the United States today, the most powerful nation in the history of the world, the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, the most educated country in the history of the world, the most charitable country in the history of the world. If there's a tsunami somewhere or an earthquake somewhere, you know who's there first? The United States. 
We send the most people. We stay the longest. We take the most money. We take the most people. The most charitable. The freest country in the history of the world. The freest country. People are dying to get in this country. Look at the immigration right now. People are trying to get here. We've been blessed. Why not a country over in the Middle East? Europe. Why, why, is it, why is it the United States? Why not in the Middle East? That's where kind of everything started. Why not one of those countries? Why not one of the European countries? That's where our ancestors came from, the Europe. Europe, most of them. You ever ask yourself why? Go back and look at our history. Our forefathers, when they came over, Puritans, the Amish, the Quakers, the Protestants, the Catholics, when they came over, the Mayflower, 16, November, 1620, right around there. One of the things they wrote, the Mayfire Compact, said we came to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's one of the things that go to the Washington Archives in Washington, D.C. You won't read anything about it, but that's what it says. Our forefathers had a fear and had a respect and had an honor of God, the Creator. Most of them are Christians. Not all of them were. But the ones, the, 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 the writers of the Declaration of Independence that weren't, you notice they put in there four times in the Declaration of Independence, they talked about a Creator. Because they had a respect and they believed in a creator, whether they were Christians or not. That's why this country has been blessed. But we better be careful. If, if, if we continue to compromise and dilute and water down the word of God, we will pay a price. You look no farther than Israel. Israel is God's chosen people. So, okay, Israel, I'm going to take you right here. This is my nation, Israel. You're going to be my people. Just do what I ask you to just do what I ask you to say. I'll give you everything you need. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll give you everything you need. Not everything you want, but I'll give you everything you need. And if these people, Am Amorites, Hittites, Canaanites, all them ites, if they want to see the God that divided the Red, Red Sea and all those miracles, look at Israel. Just watch Israel. And Israel disobeyed and God punished them. Israel disobeyed and God's punished them. Israel disobeyed and God said, All right, that's it. I'm through with you. I'm through with you. I think it was 722 B.C. The Assyrians captured northern Israel. 606 B.C. The Babylonians captured southern Israel. 586 B.C. Jerusalem fell. Israel was no more. Now God had a covenant with Israel. He, he, did, he had a covenant with Israel. God does not have a covenant with the United States. Like I said, the United States is not mentioned. So he doesn't have a covenant but it does have a covenant with his people. 70% of the people in the United States profess Christianity. Christian, Christ-like, his people. This part of the country, Meridian, this part of Mississippi, down the Bible Belt, it'd be more than probably 70%. Got to count for California and some of them, New York, some of other places, but this would, be, this, would be high, this would be higher as far as the Christian. God's got a covenant with us. Now, I mentioned all those good things about the United States. We do have problems now. We got pro I mean, there's, there's, there's as much racial division now as there ever has been. There's as much wealth division. These got, got it and these don't. There's as much religious division that there's ever been. Man, what's the answer? Man, what's the I mean, man, we've been blessed. What's the answer? We've got all these problems nowadays. We've tried a Republican president and a Democratic Congress. We've tried a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. We've tried a Republican president with a split Congress, what we got now. We've tried a Democratic president with a split Congress. We've tried every, every political, we've tried everything. We got the strongest military. It's not military. We got the strongest military. We spend more money per child in education than any country in the world. We spend more money. It's wasted, but we spend more money. We got a social program that, that does pretty good compared to other countries. What's the answer? Second Chronicles seven fourteen. I talked about Christians. Listen to this. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, who are called by my name, <laughs> Christians, if my people who are called, there's your covenant, in the United States. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek Thy face and turn from their evil ways. I'll hear their voice from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. That's the only solution. Until we have a, a, a spiritual rebirth in this country where Christians are a little more bold and will stand up, we're going to struggle. That's why he's going to have that 
that revival, those Sunday nights. Man, just get, 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 get ready to go for the year. Gonna put some gas in your tank. Those four guys can do it too. Not only that, that little banning rooster you got right there can do it too. He's pretty, he, he pretty good himself. I, I, I've heard about him. But as I mentioned, this, this, is, this is not easy. There's going to be criticism. Hey, it was hard 2,000 years ago. It's going to be hard today. I'm not big into this prosperity preaching where you hear these preachers on TV, you know, everything's going to be good. And rah. Look at the life of Christ. Was it easy on him? He got, didn't even like him in his own town. Ridicule, mocked, they killed him. Ten of the 12 disciples, I think ten or, ten or nine or ten of them, died as martyrs, standing up for something. They killed him. You got, I mean, it was tough. It's tough today. You know, uh, Tim Tebow, if you heard of Tim Tebow, that quarterback, Florida, who won the Heisman and uh, went to the NFL, did good. He's a strong. I recruited him in high school. He is the real deal. He's, he's as strong a Christian as I've ever seen. I mean, he's, he is legitimate. But he takes that knee, he puts John 3.16 up there. Boy, and the media kills him. They kill him. They just, they just ridicule him to death because he, he was a good quarterback. He wasn't a great quarterback. But he took a stand for Christ, and boy, he just got killed. It's hard. So I promise you, when you walk outside those doors, you're, fight, you're fighting higher education. You think some of these elite universities and higher education care about Judeo-Christian values? What about Hollywood? <laughs> Forget it. What about the media? Hey, no way. So you're, you're fighting all that. You better be bold and you better be strong when you go out. Yeah, I'll give you a couple examples. You can, you can go Google these on YouTube. I, I go to that YouTube a lot. And I, when I jog, I'm a jogger. I like listening to a, a Christian and atheist debate. And I listen to it on my headsets while I'm jogging. There's some great debates by, by Christian apologists and, and, and atheist apologists or Muslim apologists or whoever you want to listen to. And I listen to those things. And I, I happened to listen, see a YouTube video searching for one at Joy Behar. He, she's on that view, woman uh, on The View. He's got those women up there. And about two years ago, if you Google it, Mike Pence, Joy Behar versus Mike Pence, you can Google it. And Mike Pence, if any of you don't know, is the vice president, probably the strongest politician we've ever had. I mean, he's a strong Christian guy. He's, he's really something. But anyway, she was, she was up there on the stage with him, four or five other women. She was ridiculing to her audience. They got a live audience out there. And she was making fun of them because Mike Pence depended on God for direction talk to God, he listened for God to answer, and he would speak to him, he wanted God to answer. And as she made those statements, they were, I don't know if you, you'll watch it, they were laughing and kind of giggling and joking. And then at the end of a little conversation about Mike Pence, she said, can you believe Mike Pence talks to God and God talks to him? And she said, he's kind of crazy, he's kind of cuckoo. And the boy, they're just laughing, dying laughing out there. And I immediately thought about Galatians 6, 7. <laughs> Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. You <laughs> better be careful. Uh, it, it was not two weeks later. Uh, MSNBC, I don't watch that either. But I was Googling all of these Christian things. And uh, there was a uh, female uh, host. She was interviewing a guy named Larry Kudlow. Larry Kudlow is President Trump's economic advisor. About two years ago, he, had, he used to have a TV show. He's a real successful business guy. He didn't, he didn't need a job and she they were on what they call a split screen in TV you know about TV you got TV and they had split screen she was on one half and he was on the other he was somewhere else he wasn't in the studio so she was interviewing they were going back and forth and she said well why would you want to do this why would you want to be a member of his cabinet he said man you got money you got a TV show you got why would you want to do that and Larry Kudlow said this he says you know I'm kind of waiting. If God wants me to do it, if God thinks I can help the country, I'll do it. But I'm kind of waiting to God to steer me in the right direction. I'm kind of waiting for some clarity from God. And, and, and if he says, uh, thinks I should do it, then I'm, then I'm going to do it. And, and, and then the, 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 she ends the interview, and the split screen disappears, and it's just her looking at the television cameras. And I'll never forget. Google it. You go look at it. She says, just what we need, another politician depending on God. And she kind of rolled her eyes into the camera and it, and it left for a commercial. I immediately thought of Psalms 9, 17. A nation that turns its back on God will turn into hell. You know, you're, you're going to find obstacles and adversity when you profess Christianity and when you try to 
follow his word, but be strong. Be strong. And some of you say, man, man, what can I do? What, I mean, what can I, I'm just, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm 15 years old, 16 years old. Or I didn't go to college. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a nice car. I don't dress good. I'm, I'm just a normal, I'm just a normal person. I'm a normal, I'm just a housewife, just a salesman, just a college student. God specially is ordinary people. That's who he, that's, that's a, you ever look at, you don't see some ordinary jokers? Go look at the 12 apostles. 12, you talk about some ordinary people. At 12 of them. Five to seven of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. That means one of them were, actually worked for the Roman government. One of them was a zealot. What's a zealot? A zealot hated the Roman government. Now, can you imagine them staff meetings? The pastors got to, imagine them staff meets. You got a guy that worked for the government, and you got a guy that hated the government. And then you got some fishermen, the rest of them tent makers, farmers, uh, carpenters. You talking about, and those 12 people turned the world upside down. Still talking, 2,000 years later, still talking about what those 12 people did. Because you got to look, Christ only witnessed for three years. He died when he was 33. He didn't start his ministry until he was 30. At 30, he started looking for those 12. Probably took him about a year right around to find the 12. Actually taught them for two years, 24-7. Still talking about it today. Just average people. You would have thought Christ would have said, okay, give me a, I need a Roman emperor. I need a great military leader. I need some religious leaders. I need a couple of governors. Give me, some, give me some successful people so I can make a difference. I only got three years. If Christ were to come back today, God sent him back, he would have get. Who would he go get today? He'd go pull one out of that section. He'd go pull one out of here. Go pull one out of here. Go pull one. Go pull one. Just average people. God doesn't want your ability. Or God, God doesn't want your availability. God just wants your ability. You make yourself available to him. You're sitting there saying, well, does God know I'm here? I'm reading Mississippi. This is some guy that drove up from Destin, Florida. I mean, what, what, does God know I'm here sitting beside this person? I just saw his name on the billboard, and I came. Somebody asked me to come. I just showed up. pastor said, come, I came. Does God know I'm here? Matthew 10 29, 30, God knows the number of hairs on your head. God knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. Now, I notice some of you guys don't have much hair on your head out there. It's all right. Isaiah 49, 16, God's got your name written on the palm of his hand. So he knows you are here. He knows every, every one of you and, 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 and what you need. Everybody has a, has a platform to share their faith. Mine's large. I'll go from Washington to Miami to Fort Lauderdale, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Dallas. I was in Dallas, Houston, uh, Nebraska, Indianapolis, Memphis last week. I go all across, across the country doing this. Luke 12, 48, to much is given, much is expected. That's my platform because I was coaching. I was on TV and did a TV show for about nine years. That's my platform. To much is given, much is expected. Your platform might be different. God's going to hold us accountable for the opportunities we have. God's going to hold us accountable. Not for our sin. Christ died for our sin. Romans 14, 12. Every one of us must give an account of himself to God. Every one of us, whether you're saved or not. For the opportunities, not your sin. Like I say, Christ died for our sins. Through the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, I know I'm going to heaven. I believe in those things. I know I'm going because I believe in, I'm not, I don't deserve it. It's by the grace of God. I'll continue to sin, but God has, he's, God, Jesus, through the death of Christ, he's removed that sin. So I know I'm going. Now, I'm not homesick. I don't want to go tomorrow, but I know, but I know I'm going. And when I die and stand before God, God's going to get out that list. It's all right, God, here to get in. Tommy Bowden. All right, let me see if I got your name down here. A's, B's, Bowden, Bowden, Bobby. Do you have a father, Bobby Bowden, that was head coach at Florida State? Pretty good coach? Yeah. Well, he's in. All right, you have a mother, Ann Bowden, had six kids, had four boys. Man, she's in for sure. She's in. Do you have a brother, Terry? 
Terry Bowden, that was the head coach at Auburn. I said, yeah, he didn't make it. Nah, Terry, he's, <laughs> Terry's, he made it. He's made it. I know him. All right, right down here, Tommy Bowden. You Tommy? Yeah, Tommy Bowden. Tommy Bowden. I'll let you become the head coach of Tulane December the 6th, 1996. You're a head coach for 12 years. Every year you were a head coach, you had about 120 players in front of you. And God's going to look at me and he's going to say, did you mention my name? Did you tell them about me? Could they see me through you? Now, I have, to, I have to answer that. That was my platform. Just like you have to answer your platform. Might be your wife. Might be your husband. Might be your children. Might be a student. Somebody lockers beside you. I don't know. We all have a platform. And you're held accountable for that opportunity. You ever heard of the statement? Most of you probably heard of the providence of God. The providence of God. I heard this definition for the providence of God. Listen to this definition. Providence of God. You've probably all heard that. And I heard this definition, which at least I like. Providence of God. The intervention of God, the intervention of God with man through natural occurrences to achieve the will of God. The intervention of God with humans through natural occurrences to achieve the will of God. I talked about my platform. You're going to go home today, getting out of your car, and your neighbor's going to say, where you been? You're going to go to school Monday, and your classmate, your locker mate, your friend, your little group, what did you do this weekend? You're going to go to work Monday. Whoever you work beside say, hey, what did you do this weekend? Where did you go? Did you go hear that speaker they had coming in? The providence of God, the intervention of God with man through natural occurrences to achieve the will of God. You're going to be held accountable for opportunities, just, hey, just, like, just like I will, but, but, for, but for the same thing. Life is full of, you know, kind of ups and downs and closing this thing out. It's, life goes like that. Yeah, I don't care. That's just how it goes, whether you like it or not. There's hills and valleys. Coaching is easy to determine because if you're winning, you're up there. If you're losing, you're down there. I was doing pretty good in coaching. I was, gosh, I'd won 90 games, 11 and a half years, been coached a year three times, uh, just finished a nine-win season, signed a seven-year contract. I'll last for another three years at least with a seven-year contract. I'm doing pretty good coaching. That's pretty good. Six months later, started out losing to Alabama and Atlanta on TV. That didn't help me. But six months later, sitting there three and three, get a knock on the door. AD says, hey, it's 6.15 in the morning. Say, we're going to make a change. I said, what? What about my father? My father hit Florida, Florida State. My father was head coach at Florida State. Was the winningest coach in the history of college football for a while. Joe Paterno took it. Now he's second. He coached at Florida State. They play at Bobby Bowden Field. The field was named after him. They got a statue in front of him. Two national championships. 360-some wins. All, he's in the Hall of Fame. Winningest coach in the history of Florida State, I mean, by far. He's sitting there at 80 years old, and he says, I want to coach one more year, Florida State. Just give me one more year. They'd sh about five years later, they shook hands. He's an older guy. He's 89. He's shaking. Word, word just shake. It's good. So he's sitting at 80 years old. Wins about seven games. They fire him. That's just how it goes. You might be going pretty good. You're married. You're healthy. Your wife goes, or you go get a biopsy. Biopsy comes back. It's cancer. That's just how it goes. If life is guaranteed, three things guaranteed in life. These three things guaranteed. Whatever age you are, how wealthy you are, doesn't make it. These things guaranteed. You are in a crisis or a problem right now. Children, family, job, something right now. Health, right now, you're in a problem. Or, or I'm sorry, you're coming out of that problem. You're coming out of that problem. Or you're in it right now. The third thing, or you're fixing to go in it. That's your whole life. I don't care how old you are, how wealthy you are, or whatever. Those three things are guaranteed. You're coming out of a problem. You're in a problem. You're fixing to go in a problem. If life goes like that, give me stability. I want something concrete. I want something stable, something that doesn't deviate. That's that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's when we talk, when we talk about that relationship. Uh, many of you, know, I'm sure you've sat out there and you 
and, and some of you, many of you might be Christians, some of you might not be Christians, your young people might have doubt or indecision, some of you might have accepted Christ a long time ago and, and drifted away. And every time they have a service, you sit there and have a discussion back and forth. Man, God's saying, man, you need to, you need to be bold. You need to come down here and make a decision. Show people that, that you can be bold with accepting Christ, that relationship. And then there's that other side that argues with you. Satan said, ah, don't do it. He got one word. All Satan uses is one word. You know what it is? Wait. He said, wait. Wait till next week. Wait till next year. Wait till you got a job. Wait till you get married. Wait till you get older. Man, he's got a great word. A lot of us fall for it. But every time they, they, they talk they, about this relationship, they have an opportunity to make a decision. And you have, to, you have to make a decision. God has something called free will. You have a choice. God knows what you're going to do, but you'd be a robot if he made it for you. You've got free will. However big you are, I'm 5'9", 170 pounds right around there, and your heart's about the size of your fist. However big you are, if you sit there and you make a fist, that's how big your heart is. If you're taller and bigger than me, you have a bigger fist, you've got a bigger heart. If you're smaller and you make a fist, that's how big your heart is. And God put it in your heart, in your DNA, to have a desire to know him. There's a, there's a void in your heart that can only be filled with that relationship. And if you're not a Christian, you don't know what I'm talking about, you, you have that discussion every time you have an opportunity like this. One says go and one says wait. That's just like being at home and leaving the door unlocked because you're expecting somebody, so you leave the door unlocked, but it's closed. You're in the kitchen doing something. You hear a knock on the door. Hey, come in. Come on in. You get doing something, and all of a sudden you hear a knock again. Hey, I said, come on, let's go. Come in. It's unlocked. You get to busy again, and there's that knocking again, so you go to the door, and there's only one doorknob. There's no doorknob on the outside. Doorknob's only on the inside. You've got to open it. Jesus will sit there and knock on that door, but there's no doorknob. You've got to open it. It's got to be open from you with the decision to accept him and let him in. And I'll leave you with this picture and this analogy before the pastor comes up. Story about, the, about a nine-year-old boy he was out flying a kite with his dad. It was perfect. It was a fall, a little hilly. Wind was kicking up, cloudy, low high and low clouds. You know, but wind, boy, it's perfect for flying a kite. Well, the dad got the kite up there pretty good for a little nine-year-old. Then he handed that little spool, that little stick of wire and, or string, whatever you call you hold that kite up with now. And the little boy took it. And the little boy, he's just letting out that thing and that wind's taking that kite. And, it, and the boy letting out, he keeps letting out that string. All of a sudden, the kite disappears up in those low flying clouds. And the boy, all of a sudden, he looks up there and he said, Dad, Dad, I can't see my kite. Where'd it go? Dad says, it's right up there in those clouds. He said, I can't see it. But his dad said, no, but you can feel the tug. And when you feel that tug, whether you're 10 years old or 12 years old or 16 or 20s or 30s or 50s or 60s, whatever, you better open the door. But you got, you got, the, knob on your, you got the knob on your side. So I'll turn over to your pastor. Thank you for staying awake. And pastor, this is yours.